We have officially made it to February. That means we're going to look back and rank all of the movies that I saw in January 13 to be exact. Let's do it. What is up, Flick fans? Welcome back to the channel. It is that time where we reflect on the good and the bad. January usually brings us a lot of bad, but I won't lie to you. There were actually uh, more good movies than I expected. A surprising amount, but we're going to get into them. If I missed a movie, please let me know. I'll try to catch up at some point and leave your lists down below. What movie worked the best for you and what movie sucked? We're going to do it. If you're here right now, you're watching this video. First off, let me know just what are you doing? What are you doing right now? What's going on? Uh, second of all, if you want to drop a like, man, that would be awesome. That helps these videos. Let's talk about Plane. Very simple title, very simple movie. Gerard Butler. It's the type of action movie that you go into and you're like, I, I know what this is going to be. I know exactly what it's going to be. It's the same old thing. Or is it? Well, it kind of is. But you know what? I actually had fun with Plane. I like the fact that it wasn't this full-on action, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Gerard Butler, he can survive anything and everything. He can match up with every villain imaginable. And he's, he's a pilot in this movie. Now, he has to do things that you would not want your pilot to have to do if you're one of the passengers on this plane. Uh, but he's not as... He's not as skilled as Mike Coulter's character. Mike Coulter, he's in uh, for the wrong reasons. He's actually going straight to prison, but they get caught up in this madness, and uh, the big sequence of the plane going down, I think that was the best part of the film. It was intense, edge of your seat, everything you want, and honestly, this was a really solid theatrical experience. Once they get on the ground, we've seen this type of film before. I think they could have built up the villains better. I think they could have done a few things and adjusted a few elements to make it maybe one of the biggest surprises by the time we get to the end of the year. That being said, Plane was not a plain old movie. <laughs> Story-wise, anyway, I think visually it could have been much better. But you know what? I had fun with this. I'm starting out on a good note and going the good tier. Sorry, I had to change the background color. The black, it wasn't working for me, man. We had to liven it up a little bit. What better than... What is that? Bluish purple? Blurple. Then we have You People. I thought You People was going to be hilarious. I saw that trailer and I said, Eddie Murphy, Jonah Hill, uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. This is awesome. A stacked cast. I love the fact that Jonah Hill is involved with the writing. Uh, King Barris, you know, up and down on the filmography, the writing. But I have seen Barris work really well when it comes to writing the script and directing. I, I just thought this movie felt way cheaper than I needed it to in terms of production. The transitions, the editing, the way that it all flows, it kind of felt like a television show and not even necessarily one that could work in movie format, but it's also the plot. It starts out really strong. You get to know Jonah Hill's character, and we have these two different sides. Think meet the parents, very different backgrounds, a Jewish background, a Muslim background, and I was excited to see them interact with each other and how this romance was going to work. First of all, I think the romance needed work. I like the individual actors there, but it did not give us the, the proper backstory. They're just kind of together, and they don't even give us anything in that six months. They skip through six months, and I understand the big part of the movie is the part that they show, but not giving us that background and not feeling that uh, chemistry that maybe I needed to between the two characters. Some of the interactions with Hill and Murphy are great. Julia Louis-Dreyfus in a car, absolutely hilarious. But then you have these other sequences like Jonah Hill playing basketball and impressing Murphy's character, and that sequence is just poorly edited, poorly done, and it just it didn't work for me. It felt cheap and that was very unfortunate so unfortunately I thought you people was kind of a bad movie I wanted to like it I laughed occasionally but not all that often Josh Dumel Jennifer Lopez shotgun wedding oh really Jennifer Coolidge Jennifer Coolidge is hilarious in this movie there were actually some pretty fun moments in this film and uh, you have some sequences where Dumel and Lopez they're working off of each other and they're trying to figure things out they're working on this very recent marriage, but at the same time, they're trying to figure their way out through this situation. The entire wedding party is being held hostage, and it's up to them to save the day, figure things out, and you know, how many times have we seen a romantic film like this? How many times have we seen rom-coms with Jennifer Lopez that don't have a similar plot, but have a similar vibe to them? It's that cheeky, 
silly, kind of in your face at times, series of comedic bits that may or may not work. Thankfully, you have two really uh, talented people here in Josh Duhamel and Jennifer Lopez, but the overall result is just a movie I've seen countless times. I mean a film that I have gotten numerous examples of over the last five to ten years, and I can't even count on two hands how many movies have felt like this film, and nothing stands out apart from a cast that allows certain moments to be really funny. And then you have that big sequence where they're swinging and the, the CGI in the background and they're both together screaming. I'm like, that's that looks, it looks horrible. But you know what? Even after saying all that, you know what you're in for with this movie, and I have a feeling some people are going to enjoy it. So I'm going to put Shotgun Wedding on the meh tier. All right, so I said this month was pretty good so far. We don't have anything on the great tier. Is Missing going to be that movie? Hmm. Hmm, well, I can't quite go great for missing, but I am going to go really, really good. This is as high as you can possibly be on the good tier without uh, breaking into the next one. Missing had all of the elements of searching for me that worked out extremely well, except this time you have a different relationship at play. You have a mother and her daughter, and the mother goes missing, but... There is another mystery at play with that mother that starts to change the case. And yes, you have those really cliche scenes of people figuring everything out and trying to solve the mystery themselves. And there are a lot of conveniences in this film. I think those conveniences kept the movie from being great for me. But thankfully, Storm Reed is at the center. And Storm Reed is awesome in Missing. Seriously, she's compelling, captivating. Her relationship with a guy by the name of Javi is great. He's like the ultimate sidekick that you need in a film like this. Did not know his role would be that big. Honestly, I wish he had an even bigger role in the movie because he was my favorite part. But Storm Reed's performance is great here. And they stick to the style, that searching style where they're going through the computer and they show everything through FaceTime camera. Do kids really talk on the phone on their laptop? I don't know. I mean, I don't do it, but I'm not hip at all. Regardless, you look past those things, really enjoyed the movie. I don't love it as much as Searching, but I, I think it might be one of the best of the month. A Man Called Otto. Nobody is talking about this remake, but they should be talking about it because it's actually doing really well. It's holding strong every single weekend at the box office. Tom Hanks gives a great performance here, although he may not give the best performance in the film. Mariana Trevino is outstanding as that wonderful neighbor, she and her family, they come in, they make an impact on his life. Because, uh, you may not know this, the movie's dark. I mean, it has this liveliness to it, and uh, the ending, you know, it ends on a sulky, really emotional, but there are some subplots in there that people come in, I'm like, why, why are they taking away time between Tom Hanks and these two characters? When they're on screen together, it's amazing. It really is. It's like the best chemistry you've seen in a movie like this. The grumpy old man, the cheerful mom. They're complete opposites, but they say opposites attract. And they are just, this family is made to make an impact on his life. But again, he attempts to end his life a few times in this movie. So uh, the themes may not be something that some people will want to see going into A Man Called Otto, but if you are up for something like that, I do think it is a good movie, it's a good time in the theater, Tom Hanks gives a Tom Hanks performance, finally, it's been a while, pal, but I'm gonna go A Man Called Otto on the good tier, I think it's a good film. Zhang Yi on Netflix, this feels like Alita Battle Angel, this feels like a mixture between, and I could go on and on, you know, your Blade Runners, your Artificial Intelligences, the Spielberg film, not what's going on Right now with the websites, what's the chat? GPT D Elemental P. This is an entertaining film, and there are times where the special effects are actually really great in this movie. There are also times where it doesn't look as good as it needs to. There's one scene very reminiscent of iRobot, the movie with Will Smith, uh, but the CGI is also reminiscent to iRobot, so I'm like, ah, man. Uh, and as opposed to Alita Battle Angel, they don't go down an action path with this film. And I had some pushback on my review. They're like, Austin, of course, listen, you, you dummy, you don't understand that this movie was trying to be more than just an action movie. I understand it. I, I get that it was trying to be more, and I appreciate the attempt. I like the fact that that subverted my expectations as I was watching. Unfortunately, they don't handle that in a way that entices you and pulls you in and it doesn't have the depth that it makes you think 
it has because they just don't explore the characters on the level that they are honestly trying to. They're making an attempt to uh, kind of make this a character study and pose questions like, what does it mean to be AI as opposed to human? And I, I like that. But it doesn't come together. There's also one character in this movie, and I said it before, that's really annoying, and I just couldn't get on board. The main performance is really good. Rest in peace to one of the main actresses. Unfortunately, I just didn't love the film, uh, but I didn't hate it. I'm going to go meh. This one I did hate. This movie stinks. It stinks. Listen, there are bad movies, and then there are awful movies. That's why I distinguish those two tiers. You people, I'm not going to sit back and say, ah, it's the worst movie I've ever seen. It's just a bad comedy, right? This movie is bad. Now, I like the concept of fear. Each person has their own very distinct fear, and the movie plays on that. Their fears come out to haunt them. We're also dealing with uh, an airborne disease, you know, you know, they're doing the thing. They're doing the thing. They're trying to make you scared. There are a lot of jump scares in this movie that maybe one or two work. Maybe one or two have me like, uh, oh, oh, me. <laughs> oh, didn't like the characters, didn't like the way they handled the characters, didn't like the cheapness of the scares, didn't like the cheapness of the movie. I just didn't like the experience. I, I just, I don't like fear. I think it's bad. This is what I expected from all of these January movies. And hey, so happy I got it. Thanks, fear. Oh yeah, I gotta put it on the awful tier. Almost forgot. <laughs> Great. Christian Bale, the pale blue eye. The pale blue eye is one of those that I was really excited for. Scott Cooper, you know, I'm up and down on him as a director, but I'm always, like, pumped for his films. It doesn't matter if I think the movie's going to be good or not because I think his atmosphere, his style, the pacing of his movies, they don't always work, but that's the type of film that I often appreciate, right? So you get this film, which is distinctly different from his other movies, Hostels, uh, most recently Antlers, loved Hostels, didn't love Antlers. Where am I on the pale blue eye? Well, Christian Bale is giving an amazing performance. Harry Melling is really, really good. He's also playing Edgar Allan Poe, a very different version of Edgar Allan Poe in this film, one that I've seen a lot of divisiveness on. People love it. People hate it. I thought it was great. And it's that chemistry, it's that relationship, that bond that gets Bale's character through this mystery that he's attempting to solve. The problem with that mystery is, is it... It wasn't as compelling as the movie was trying to make it, and you didn't really get a history of those involved with this murder, and when we approach it at the beginning, he just starts solving it. And I'm like, ah, I needed something at the beginning. As long as this movie feels, and this is one example of Cooper's films where I did feel the pacing, as opposed to something like Hostels where, yeah, it's slow pace, but I think that works in the movie's favor. Doesn't work in a pale blue eye's favor, but I think the experience overall, and the fact that it was getting a bit too slow for me, but there is a twist ending that will throw a lot of people off. For me, I respect it. I like the fact that they did something different. So all in all, I think this is an okay movie on Netflix, but the performances are great. Infinity Pool, Brandon Cronenberg. You know the name. We know exactly what we're getting with a movie like this, or do we? I had some questions at the end of Infinity Pool, and the fact that it is basically, you know, once, and I'm not going to say what, what happens happens in this movie, then it's a, a series of events that kind of, you know, go on and on. It's the same shtick over and over, but in that way, I kind of appreciate what the movie was going for, even though I wish there was more to that third act, but it's also the type of movie that's playing on the rich, and the same themes that we saw in Triangle of Sadness and The Menu and White Lotus were seen in this film, just done in a more messed up horror, thriller, sci-fi type of way, and that spin, that twist, is something that I, I really enjoy. And I thought this movie started out on a strong note. Skarsgård performance, understated at the beginning, outlandish at the end. Mia Goth, she is what we expected, but she's great in the movie. So there are really great elements. I don't know if it brought it home at the end. I, I respect a lot of things as we go, but I did find myself feeling that repetitiveness of what we're getting in the second half of the film. And what it's trying to say, I'm not sure if it fully communicated that message. Regardless, I had fun with this. I'm going good tier for Infinity Pool. Doggone. Dog. Doggone. Doggone it. When his dog goes missing, a young man embarks on an incredible search. I just hit my finger. With his parents to find him and give him a life-saving medication. That's a great premise. I am a dog lover. I have two dogs. I think they are just the best things ever and... And my older one is getting really old and it makes me sad. And then I watch a movie like this and I get more sad. 
and I don't like it. First of all, the main character, the protagonist of this movie, uh, no, nope, nope, no, didn't like him, didn't like him at all, just, just didn't like him. I like Rob Lowe in this movie, I think the message is a good one, there are uh, themes here when it comes to family and loving those around you, whether it's a human or a dog, and then, you know, the dog runs away and it's really sad, it's a Nickelodeon movie, it's a straight-to-TV you know, happy, cheery, go lucky movie with the the manufactured drama and a terrible script. It's exactly what I expected from this film. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I don't know how many of you guys watch Dog Gone. I wanted to enjoy. It. I love, love dogs, and the dog in this movie is really sweet, really cute. But again, the main character, I just didn't like him. Let's go, let's go bad tier. I guess it's not awful because dogs are cute. Sick. Or sick. A COVID thriller? Ah, fooey. Come on, man. You're going to turn this into a slasher movie that actually works and was pretty fun? Okay. You know what? I had fun with Sick. I didn't know why it was a COVID thriller at first, and then you get into the third act, and you realize why, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Crazy twist. Crazy movie. Blood gore. Characters that do, you know, main character in horror film type of things where they're running too slow or they make a dumb decision or something's happening. I'm like, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? What's the, what's the point of that? But I was able to push those frustrations aside because the plot here was actually, I mean, simple, but it was a little more compelling than I expected to be. The twist kind of funny, but I like the twist. I liked what they were trying to do, but the focus here is on the slasher element, the thrills, the chills, the blood, the gore, the very familiar kills, but they're handled in a way that showcases all of that. And I actually thought Sick worked. Is this, what was it, Peacock? I think it was Peacock. It's worth a watch on Peacock. Let's go good tier for Sick. I, I, you know, it was pretty good. Then we have The Wandering Earth 2. And if you didn't watch The Wandering Earth 1, this is a sequel that is a prequel. It's everything that happened before the first Wandering Earth. So we get the buildup, we get a years and years span, we start out with these characters when they're young, and as we move through time, more things are happening, you know, this planet is exploding, this gravitational field is pulling us in, and we have to do these, these big battles, whether it be in the sky, or going to another planet, going into space, and you have every type of fight on a jet, with a drone, hand-to-hand -hand combat, imaginable. In this movie, it's a big, epic Chinese blockbuster that actually had a pretty compelling story. What I was missing from the first Wandering Earth, I think this movie does a better job of. Better characters, better build-up, more depth. You get the cheese, you get some of the silliness, and some of those moments in the first Wandering Earth that I just did not like, they do carry over here, but there's less of that, and more of an emphasis on the blockbuster action massive elements that are going to draw people to the theater. Now, is it doing big numbers in the United States? Not necessarily. I had to drive an hour and a half just to see this film on the big screen. But I think it's worthy of being seen on the big screen. A little lengthy. Three hours, I think, is too long. Uh, but I like this way more than The Wandering Earth. And I had a really good time in the theater. Some of the best CGI I've seen in years. I mean, it looked phenomenal. Let's go The Wandering Earth 2 on the good tier. And then finally, Megan. I had a good time with Megan. Megan is self-aware, both the doll and the movie. Uh, very aware of the type of film it's trying to be. It's not a pure horror film. I think a lot of people were kind of expecting it to be that. It's much more of a horror comedy. And it's very much in the vein of what that Chucky reboot was, except I believe it handles certain elements better. I actually like the Chucky reboot, so I'm not going to say it's, oh, it's a lot better. No, it just handles certain elements better. Now, there are things about the main characters. You have Allison Williams, who plays Gemma. She does a great job, but the character of Gemma, just kind of the way she treats this young girl and Katie, and doing things over and over that are so irresponsible as a guardian, I get it. That's what the movie was trying, but it kind of irked me. I'm like, why, why are you doing that? Why are you making this decision and making the little girl do this and using her for your benefit? You are a horrible horrible guardian and there are certain things like with the crooked ceo the guy who you know is shady and very cliche a bit of a backstory there that they try to tap into but i didn't get everything i needed from that side of the story what works here is megan megan is a lot of fun to watch some of those kills as it escalates and ramps up they're pg-13 kills but they still work and 
I was having a really good time with the third act of this movie. As many questions as I was asking my head, I'm like, you know what? Just turn your brain off. Enjoy it. And that's what I did for the most part with Megan. So not quite loving it as much as some fans did, but I'm still putting it on the okay tier at the end of the day. So let's rank these movies from worst to best. At the very bottom, obviously, we have Fear, the movie that, um, you know, it just feels like a January movie. Unfortunately, on the bad tier, I may, you know, I may switch these two. Again, doggone, it has a dog in it, so I'm going to put doggone slightly above you people. Uh, on the meh tier, let's go Shotgun Wedding slightly below Zhang Yi because, you know, at least Zhang Yi had that sci-fi feel to it. On the okay tier. I do think Megan was fun, and because it was more fun than The Pale Blue Eye, it just works in different ways. I'm gonna go Megan at the top of the OK tier, but here's the surprise, folks. We have six movies on the good tier in January. 2023 is not off to a bad start, but now we have to rank them. I'm gonna keep The Wandering Earth 2 at the bottom, but I am gonna go plain slightly above that in that fifth spot. Next up, Sick, right where it belongs. But I just think Infinity Pool, it just, it's so different and distinct. I think it slightly has the edge above A Man Called Otto, which goes in the three spot, Infinity Pool at the two spot, and at the one spot, I'm going missing. A movie that almost, almost made the great tier, but couldn't quite get there. So again, January, it's not often that month where I'm going, oh, that's a great film, but to have six on the good tier in January is pretty good. And you may have seen December movies like Babylon in January. That's not on my January list. I saw those early December, right? But for me, these are the films that I've seen. But again, what did I miss? Did you like this list? What is your best and worst of the month? Thanks for joining me. Some great reviews. Knock at the Cabin coming this weekend. And uh, maybe you season four, you might be seeing that on the channel. I'm also counting down the best of the decade so far. I'll see you guys soon.